Ezekiel Elliott on the, at the same time. Check this out. If you put both of those true stories together, you'll get what happened with that. The Cowboys ran the ball on first down more than anybody in the world. Again, the Cowboys ran the ball on first down more than anybody in the world. Guess what that leads to? Predictability. And if your offense is predictable, then your offense is not going to be effective. How about this? If Skip Bayless knows you're going to run the ball on first down, Shannon Sharp knows you're going to run the ball on first down, you don't think the defensive coordinator and head coach on the other team know the same thing? Hey, switch it up, Mr. Garrett. That's why his ass is no longer the head coach of the Dallas Cowboys. Point blank period. That's why he is not that. That's why he does not have that job anymore. But nobody talks about that. All you talk about is the shortcomings of Dak Prescott and how Ezekiel Elliott is doing well. But if you have a game plan that's extremely predictable, you have talent that is dissipating and eroding, what happens is you become very predictable and people contain you. And when they contain you, they beat you to death. And then when they go up big numbers, you got Dak throwing you back into the game. And then the coach goes back to his predictability. And then you lose eight out of 16 games. But we don't talk about that. They don't go into, they don't go in depth with that on ESPN. What they do is give you fluff, give you fodder, and they don't allow you to look into it. See, this is my time to get on ESPN's ass. If ESPN was about informing the sports fan, what they would do is this. What they would have done is this. They don't have any new programming, but they still have program directors and creators on their staff. What they would have done is taught you the game of football to engage you. Who does not like a good old-fashioned barbershop art? I didn't think so. Everybody likes that. Everybody loves to talk crazy, talk reckless, have a good time, tell the next person, man, you don't know what the hell you're talking about, especially when you've looked at ESPN and seen how the game works. You could have been teaching people football, basketball, and baseball right now making them more interested in your product if they have if there's more interest in the product then you don't have to have those eggheads sitting on the on tv talking about deep analytics and, and, and empirical data and things like that because last time i know i mean i only been doing this whole argue about sports thing the vast majority of my life you know uh uh i've only been doing it the vast majority of my life so what what am i to do uh, I'm going I'm to go back in my mind and ask myself when I use the term advanced analytics by sitting around arguing with my cousins, by sitting around at a cookout, or sitting around in a barbershop, or sitting at a bar. I've used that exactly the same amount of times that I've kissed a man, zero, or wanted to kiss a man, less than zero. So... Teach your audience what they're watching and they will engage. If somebody shows you chess, chess becomes interesting. If you go bowling, bowling is fun, so you're interested. You'll learn more about it. My man, Joe from Houston, was teaching me bid whist the other day. Now I'm interested. I had no idea how the hell that worked. My man, Joe, taught me. Now I'm interested. I'm going to learn how to play bid whist. It's just in your natural inclination, especially when you a dude. If you know one more thing than your boy, you sit back and wait. And you wait on him. He does not say everything about 1975. I just found it everything about 75. And then you throw it on him and you go, you don't know more than me, boy. You don't know. And if ESPN is teaching you baseball, teaching you basketball, teaching you football, instead of saying, this is the greatest player we ever seen. We've never seen anything like Steph Curry. Oh, my bad. I forgot that I saw Nate Archibald and Pete Maravich. I forgot I saw those guys. I forgot that I saw Chris Jackson. I forgot about, uh, uh, I forgot that, uh, uh, I saw Nate Archibald, Chris Jackson, Pete Maravich, Isaiah Thomas. Uh, uh, we've never seen a six foot ten inch guy We've never seen a six foot ten inch guy play like Bob, uh, uh, play like Kevin Durant. My bad. I forgot that I saw Bob McAdoo, 16, led the league in scoring on several occasions. Came off the Laker bench and helped him win the championship. I forgot that I saw that, man. My bad. Get the hell out. See, again, man, they want, they don't want you to know that if you want to have a real spread floor, you can still put a dude in the post. This is three point shooting league. Guess what? When you have a guy like Carl Anthony Towns, who's seven foot tall and extremely athletic, and you want to put him in a situation, you want you want three points. This is what you do. 
you dump it down to him since all these dudes don't really want to deal with him in the post. He goes up, dunks. He's an 80% free throw shooter. That's, guess what happens? You get one dude closer to getting the hell out of the game, and you get another dude who's going to give you three points. Dig that. Attrition. Every sport in the history of the world is about attrition. That's what it's about. It's not about, oh, I'm more athletic than you. Because Jerry Rice wasn't more, he wasn't faster than most people without the football in his hand. You never saw anybody catch him up from behind. You used to always hear Chris Carter, his slope. You never saw somebody run him down. You never saw any of that stuff. So if you educate your fans like your man do every Tuesday, 5 p.m., 6 p.m., down with Bill for this network for the strong, not the weak, you'll have people in games. That's why y'all listen. That's why we got people all over the world listening. Because people on my network, on our network, excuse me, no disrespect to my partners, the people on our network know what the hell they're talking about. We're engaging. We, DJ Knox knows hip hop. Cheers Round, she knows hip hop. Lisa Duke knows sensual music. DJ Mookie B is a two step king. And I'm the big loud mouth. No, no, no. Everybody loves the big loud mouth. Man, shut the hell up. You don't know what you're talking about. Sorry, not, you know. But this is where they are failing. And speaking of an epic thought, oh, Jesus Christ, how is it that you got people like Dan Olowski on ESPN speaking matter of factly about things that he couldn't do? Dan Olowski spent 12 years in Mass Football League and he's most famous for stepping out of the end zone by mistake. He is most famous for giving the other team two points. See, it's cool. I get it, man. Those who can't teach and those, those who can't do and those who can't teach, I understand that. But when you get a dude on there speaking matter of fact, you know, stop it, man. Come on. As Ed Love will say, come on. Fuck out of here. Dan Olowski seems to be a cool guy. He tells some funny stories every once in a while. But he is reading right out of the company playbook. Everything he says is right off the company page. And we understand it, and I get it, man. You gotta maintain your employment. But if, if, hey, Dan, how about this, bro? How about this? Let's get some originality. Let's make sure you are interesting, and then people will engage with you more. I called him out on Twitter several times. He don't respond to me no more because it's it's the facts, bro. It's the facts. I only deal with the facts. I'm not dealing with no emotion. I'm not dealing with none of that. I'm not dealing with none of that nonsense. I'm really not dealing with any of that nonsense. So I get it. This is just purely my perspective, but I try to base my perspective on facts, not these hypotheses like Skip Bayless. This entire argument is if, but, could have. Don't nobody care about if, but, could have. If I would hit the power ball last week, I could have been on Aruba and not dealing with this damn pandemic. But I didn't. Therefore, I'm here. And it's all good. I don't want to hear all that, man. Let's have some fun. Let's talk about sports. Y'all already know what time it is. It's time for this moment in black history. I need to share some information with my brothers and sisters. Make this real live, all the way live, like Lakeside. It's your man, H. Rob B. It's the End of the Bench Podcast. I'm going to tell you live and direct. Pandemic Entertainment. It's your boy. Hold on tight. It's going to be good. What up, African world? It's Home Team here, and welcome back to another video of African history, culture, and worldview. And by supporting this channel on Patreon, you're helping in the creation of these videos and supporting this content. If you'd like to show your support, you may do so by clicking the Patreon link in the description box below. Sarah Rector was often referred to as the richest colored girl in the world in the early 20th century. Born in 1902, she was a member of the Muskegee Creek Nation in Oklahoma. Following the Civil War, Rector's parents who were formerly enslaved by Creek tribe members, 
were entitled to land allotments under the Dawes Allotment Act of 1887. As a result of this act, hundreds of black children, or the so-called Creek Freedmen Miners, were each granted 160 acres of land as Indian Territory integrated with Oklahoma Territory to form the state of Oklahoma in 1907. The parcel allotted to Sarah Rector was located in Glenpool, 60 miles from where she and her family lived. It was considered inferior soil, as better land was reserved for white settlers and members of the tribe. The land given to them required an annual tax of $30, which was becoming a burden for her father. He petitioned the court to sell the land, but the petition was denied. Sarah's father then leased the land to the Standard Oil Company, and in 1913, an independent oil driller, B.B. Jones, drilled a well on the property, which produced a gusher that began to bring in 2,500 barrels of oil a day. Sarah began to receive a daily income of $300 from this strike, which equates to about $7,000 a day today. Over time, her popularity began to bloom as her wealth increased. Sarah received numerous requests for loans, money gifts, and even marriage proposals from four Germans even though she was just 12 years old. At the time, a law required Native Americans, black adults, and children who were citizens of Indian territory with significant property and money to be assigned a well-respected white guardian. As a result, Sarah's guardianship switched from her parents to a white man named T.J. Porter. Concerned with her well-being and her white financial guardian, early NAACP leaders fought to protect Sarah and her fortune as these so-called white guardians were nefarious in their dealings with assigned black subordinates. In 1914, the Chicago Defender published an article claiming that her estate was being mismanaged by grafters and her so-called ignorant parents, and that she was uneducated, dressed in rags, and that she lived in an unsanitary shanty environment. National African American leaders such as Booker T. Washington and W.E.B. Du Bois became increasingly concerned about her welfare. Of course, none of the allegations were true as Sarah and her siblings went to school in Taft, an all-black town, and they lived in a modern five-room cottage and they owned an automobile. That same year, Sarah enrolled in the Children's House, a boarding school for teenagers at the Tuskegee Institute in Alabama. Everything changed for Sarah, even her race apparently, as her wealth prompted the Oklahoma legislator to declare Sarah to be a white person so that she would be allowed to travel in first class accommodations on the railroad. By age 18, Sarah was estimated to be worth $1 million, which equates to about $11 million today. She owned stocks and bonds, a boarding house, a bakery and restaurant in Muskegee, Oklahoma, and 2,000 acres of land. She eventually left Tuskegee with her family and moved to Kansas City, Missouri, where she bought a very elaborate home that still stands today known as the Rector House. In 1922, she married Kenneth Campbell, the second African-American to own an auto dealership, and together they became African-American royalty. The couple had three sons, drove expensive cars, and entertained elites like Joe Lewis, Duke Ellenting, and Count Bassey at their expensive home. Sarah lived a comfortable life and enjoyed her wealth. She dressed really well and made sure to get the finest clothing. One noteworthy deed of hers is instructing her driver to drive the kids in the neighborhood to school. Unfortunately, this all came to an end as Sarah lost a lot of her wealth during the Great Depression, as did many Americans in general. Upon her death, at the age of 65, she only managed to hold on to some working oil wells and real estate holdings. Well, I'm all out, guys. If you like these videos and want to help out in its continued production, please consider supporting the home team on Patreon.com. The link is in the description box below. Know thyself. Remember your ancestors. Peace. Welcome back to the End of the Bench Podcast. As usual, it's your man, HYB, coming at you live and direct. I hope you enjoyed that moment in history. Everything I play is to uplift you. It's to it, it make you 
understand that you're not just another person. 